In this episode, I'm joined by Iris van der Town, who is Professor in Theory of Cultural Inquiry at Utrecht University. In this episode, we discuss Michel Serre's text, Thumbelina, in relation to knowledge, education, understanding, generational thinking, and millennial culture. I'd like to thank all my paid subscribers and patrons for making this work possible, and if you'd like to support Emetics or become part of the community, please find the links in the description below. Enjoy. So, Iris uh, van der Twaun, uh, thanks for joining us on Hermetics for this sort of uh, sort of notable episode, fifth in the Hermetic series, or the Sayre series, but also the first ever woman on Hermetics, not for lack of trying, but, uh, but welcome anyway, thanks for coming on. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, yeah. So we're going to talk about Michel Serre's text, Thumbelina, uh, Thumbelina, The Culture and Technology of Millennials, which isn't as sort of ridiculous as it sounds. It's actually a very profound book and says extremely funny in it, but as beautiful as ever. Um, but before we jump in, just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your work, um, why this book's so sort of precious to you and uh, how you first came across Michel Serre. Yes, so thank you. Um, so yes, my name is Iris van der Tuin. I work at Utrecht University and uh, I have sort of two main responsibilities. Like first, I'm a full professor in theory of cultural inquiry. Uh, so uh, I have a, a research position and then I'm also director of education of the School of Liberal Arts, which is a school that uh, brings together two programs, one uh, liberal arts and sciences, an interdisciplinary program that covers basically the entire university. And then there's language and culture studies, which is a broad program in the humanities. Um, so that's uh, what I do. And um, as uh, a researcher, I read uh, Michel Serre, uh, but also very much as an educator. Um, so I really enjoy bringing Thumbelina to two millennials, uh, to my students, and uh, talking with them about what, uh, what Sarah, um, yeah, how Sarah actually diagnoses uh, their generation. Uh, and I remember there were two people that uh, uh, kind of int- that introduced me to Thumbelina. Uh, one of them is Rick Dolfijn, which is, he's my co-author uh, of uh, many years. We, in t- 20, 10, we published uh, new, um, new Materialism, Interviews and Cartographies. And then there's Vera Bullman, uh, who was at the time, she was at ETH Zurich. Now she is at the Technical University in Vienna. And they both told me about Thumbelina and about the, the very affirmative take on teaching and learning in the algorithmic condition that, that comes uh, uh, to the fore in, in that book. Uh, So what works best in class for students that are digital natives, that have great media literacy uh, or certain ICT habits, let's say, uh, but that need uh, academic shaping? And and how are we going to do that? Um, So so that's very much how I read uh, this this particular SARE book. Um, And in that sense, it's uh, informed also by my work with Felicity Coleman, Vera, as mentioned, and Ashlyn O'Donnell on the algorithmic condition, and my work with Anna Hickey Moody and another uh, Utrecht colleague, Nana Verhoef, on ICT habits of of young people. Okay, so before we jump into the book, I do need to ask you the hermetics question. Um, You can place three thinkers living or dead into a room and listen in on the conversation. Um, who Who do you pick? I would pick um, Suzanne K. Langer, uh, who is my favorite philosopher at the moment. Uh, she published a Philosophy in a New Key in uh, 1942. Uh, she published a lot uh, on uh, the theory of art. Um, she published a massive volume on mind uh, later in her in her work. Uh, I would in that room. I would also put uh, Alfred North Whitehead, who was her teacher. Um, uh, and then also her colleague and friend Ernst Kassirer. Uh, and for me, the, 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 the conversation would be a conversation about style, or at least that's what I would like to learn. Um, so I've read a lot of Whitehead. Uh, I've read a lot of Kassirer. I'm reading everything I can uh, from Suzanne Langer. Uh, but the way in which she navigates uh, the kind of, let's say, continental, different continental styles and also the, the different styles, between the, 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 the way in which styles differ between analytic and continental philosophers. I, I would like to see that 
played out in a conversation. I mean, I have never uh, heard a recording of Langer or anything, but uh, I, I see her as, uh, you know, a uh, humble, uh, quite sweet, uh, quite smart, uh, and 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 probably also. Uh, emancipated uh, philosopher, but how is she going to navigate these these people and all of these different uh, different styles? I would be really interested in in overhearing that conversation and later analyzing it. So, do you think um, do you think styles sort of underrepresented in philosophy? Then I don't necessarily think it's underrepresented in in philosophy. I think the the philosophy that I read. Um, uh, deals with style a lot, and uh, but uh, I I I would just think that that's something that that I would I would I would get from that conversation. So we have a whitehead that moved from the UK to the US. Uh, he started to write in a completely different way, you know, after he uh, he arrived in the US. And then there's Cassira. There's the question of translation obviously there's Suzanne Langer who knows multiple languages and and I think one of the reasons why I'm so interested in her work is because she brings together uh, and she brought together from very early on in her career uh, philosophers from many different uh, from many different uh, countries uh, and continents so because of her linguistic um, knowledge and 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 uh, capabilities so I studied uh, right before the, the corona pandemic uh, started uh, and, and started to prevent us from uh, from traveling uh, intercontinentally. I studied Suzanne Langer's um, card index system uh, in the library at Harvard University. And, uh, you know, I found and in that that card index, she's basically uh, uh, yeah brought together collected kind of um, cards, index cards on whatever she read. And I, I found, uh, of course, English, French, German, Italian. Uh, I even found some some Dutch uh, texts. So she brings together a lot. And yeah, and, and then obviously uh, she is a very eclectic thinker that can bring together Whitehead and Cassira. And and she's a logician, so she also knows how to write in in this very yeah in this very analytical kind of style. So how how does she navigate that? I would be very interested. Do you use do you use Langer in your in your own work? I do read uh, Langer, uh, and I'm writing a lot about her. Uh, my my recent or or my current I have to say book project is a book project on Langer. Uh, because and and I'm writing about her from the perspective of a certain computational style of of thinking and writing. She brings together like so many different sources, and she 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 especially in in the mind volumes, she works in such an interdisciplinary way. I'm I'm very interested in how how she does it. How does she bring together all of these uh, uh, thinkers, all of these disciplines, all of these cultures? Um, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out, uh, and I'm using uh, procedural thinking, computation for that. I'm, I'm really trying to figure out how um, this has been made possible, uh, how she has made that all possible for herself in a way. And the CART index system is, uh, is a great tool. Uh, not only a tool that she has used, obviously, but also a tool for my for my research. So, is, is this going to be a full length book on Langer? Yes, I'm planning to uh, to write a book on uh, on Langer, like a monograph. Um, and there's there's a couple of monographs that have been published on Langer, um, but the interesting thing is that uh, all of these uh, colleagues have. Um, try to um, uh, interpret or have interpreted Langer as someone who worked uh, within a particular tradition. So either she worked in the tr in the tradition of American pragmatism, or she was really a White Hadian, or a Cassirer, a Neo Kantian, or whatever. And and I'm always like, no, this is first of all, uh, this is a a reduction of. Uh, what what she's brought together in her oeuvre, it does not work uh, with this idea of an abundant 
um, uh, yeah, there's there's this this new key in philosophy. With with that, she means that you know there, there's this this new new key really opens up a kind of thinking about art that 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 brings together sources uh, from like all over the academic uh, spectrum. So how can you then reduce that to a purely philosophical kind of canon, <laughs> and then to a particular um, yeah tradition within that canon? And the second point is, of course, that uh, she has only been read in relation to male philosophers. And of course, I repeated that. I said that, you know, I want to bring her in uh, in a room with Whitehead and, and Kassira. So there's always this tendency to do that when it comes to the work of Langer. And, and she herself uh, has also done that. I mean, look at the dedications of her books. They're all dedications to male philosophers. But when you study her her card index system, you see that she was working in an uh, how do you say in a in a universe of female scholars. So she has read so widely that when you start writing down all of the names of female scholars that she has read and that she has quoted, you know you 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 produce endless lists. So um, I'm also very much into reading Langer as someone that disrespected. Uh, gender boundaries and disciplinary uh, boundaries, because uh, that's what I see in the um, in the card index system. Do you think that's why you have such an interest in Sarah as well? Because he's not someone who can be, you know, people say he's a Leibnizian or a just purely communications, or it's all to do with a parasite, and they'll try pin him down to one or a, an Epicurean or something like that. But really, you're working with something which is much wider which is really difficult to pin down you're working just with philosophy itself and he, he also pulls from such a wide array of sources do you think do you, is that where your primary interest lie in philosophers who aren't honing honing themselves down totally and this is um i mean and again here uh these two um kind of functions in a way these two roles that i have at utrecht university come to the fore as a researcher and as an educator i'm interested in uh, interdisciplinarity, let's say, and uh, this this started uh, when I was working uh, in the gender studies department at Utrecht University, where I wrote my PhD about canonization processes in feminist theory, feminist philosophy, and I realized that in philosophy or in feminist studies, sorry, we we have uh, reproduced a very linear, a very hierarchical take on canonization. And, and I've, uh, you know, start, since I was a PhD student, I, I really wanted to kind of rethink how we as feminist scholars work on canonization and how, how we can do, how can we do, my question was, how can we do canonization uh, classification uh, uh, differently? And I used Rosie Bridotti's uh, image uh, or, or figure um, or, or tool to think with of uh, the, the cartography for that. So I, I tried to figure out how we could, how we could think uh, in, in horizontal, dynamic, and, and in a way algorithmic, although I didn't say that, uh, ways about, about bringing together our, uh, our sources, our authors, uh, our role models, and, and in that sense, also emancipating students that, that have always done that. I mean, you, you set up a course in, let's say, the historiography of feminist thought. You, 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 you make this mistake of representing black feminism uh, in, in week one and lesbian feminism in week two and, you know, postmodern feminism in week three. And, and students, they, they start to disrespect these these boxes they they think out of the box and and i really wanted to wanted us as as educators to come up with tools for them methods for them to actually um uh, uh, become emancipated about these very creative ways of 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 thinking with uh feminist thinkers feminist theorists so you think those boxes are actually contrary to what the, to the arguments they're putting forward, much like in the same way that many people have used Derrida or Foucault to actually single themselves or to atomize themselves as an identity. Do you think those boxes are actually more harmful to the emancipation? 
Well, for for young people, uh, and and then we we I think we approach the the Thumbelina book. I think for young people, definitely, there's always like texts remain alive. Texts are always in motion. Texts generate connections to to uh, like unexpected connections to other texts, to images, to moving images, to memes, and and this is this is usually this is what students do in the classroom with us uh, as their as their educators but when we don't validate these these very creative methods uh, then we we do um, then then it is actually these 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 boxes these these canon ca- yeah cl- classifications in a way they they are really harmful to uh, for them and and for their um, uh, development so, so it was always my idea to, to, uh, and and of course I'm not the first one. I mean, you mentioned Derrida uh, just a minute ago or something. So there's there's been lots of scholars, lots of philosophers that have been thinking about this. Uh, Leotard is another example, you know, working through, uh, working through and beyond, as Sarah Ahmed uh, has has adjusted that phrase. So there's there's so many scholars that have been thinking about like there's always more to a text than uh, than than what the canon actually wants us to reproduce about that text, and and for me it's 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 not only intellectually stimulating but it is also uh, emancip- emancipatory I think for students um, uh, when we develop methodologies that do justice to this. So for example. Uh, I worked a lot on the diffractive method, the, the the method of reading and writing diffractively, and and I've tried to implement that method in classrooms, and I've tried to tell students, whatever you scribble in the margins, that's that's probably uh, very important knowledge production. It's not just like a little side note that you may or may not bring to class. No, take it seriously and try to unpack. The connection that you have made, um, and and of course there's this is even in terms of like method classroom method this is not new. Think about uh, this long tradition that uh, Rutgers University has in um, publishing the New Humanities Reader and and publishing a method and and really establishing a method of connective thinking and connective writing. So these methods are out there, but um, you know my my Suzanne Langer example and your Michel Serre example, uh, they tell us that in philosophy we are very fond of 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 actually ignoring those methods, and and sticking to to a linear classified uh, representation of knowledge, and and in that sense um, not taking what students do with thinkers with concepts seriously. Okay, that's interesting. I was recently having a conversation with um, a lecturer called Rico Schneller, and he's he's he was along this idea of writing in the margins of something. He, he put forward this idea that the the most interesting conversations, the most interesting knowledge, comes from spontaneous chats in stairwells or at the end of the lecture is always the most important stuff because there's this weird, strange moment of excitement and anticipation for moving. So you have this sort of time pressure to. Um, to sort of just quickly make the connections, whereas you're not constrained by the, you know, the the hour of of the lecture. Um, so do you? I, think- no, I, I just wanted to say that that I find that very very interesting and a very helpful uh, example also, and 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 further unpacking of of what I was trying to say to say, because what you're saying is that these conversations usually happen outside the classroom. Uh, and and what I'm trying to say to students is bring these insights or or these these it, it, it's not really insights when I'm saying that, you know, uh, there is something to Bergson um, in the work of um, of Karen Barad. It's it's a weird connection that then needs a lot of a lot of attention and a lot of scholarship and, and care Um and and uh, yeah, I, I I bring these these moments uh, deliberately into uh, the classroom, and I'm actually trying to help students to to take those moments and those beginning insights in a way uh, seriously for 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 their papers, for example. 
Yeah. Do you think, do you think that's what says trying to do in part is to say to bring the um, to use like a Deleuzian example, like to bring the smooth conversations into a striated space and allow them to sort of almost disrupt that space. Well, what what Sarah, of course, is um, is trying to do is is he is um, of course he's he's what he's saying is that the the, the these these obviously uh, you know of course in Deleuze says the same thing these these two spaces uh, they happen at the same time so I can be a very striated teacher like giving this top-down frontal kind of lecture to students and what is happening in the classroom in the lecture hall is of course something that is way more smooth and and the point is I think that these two uh, these two modes I, I don't want to, uh, I'm not into uh, trying to find some sort of middle way, uh, but I'm, I'm interested in acknowledging both. Um, and, and what Sarah does in, in Thumbelina, when he talks about the chatter, uh, you know, and this, this, this constant uh, flowing of information uh, from outside classrooms uh, to the inside of, of classrooms and, and within the classroom uh, among students, uh, I, I, he he wants to take that very 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 seriously, and he wants to say that this is actually the most important flow of information in classrooms, and it is where we have to start uh, our pedagogical or didactic uh, project, uh, because uh, these these lectures, I mean, especially now post. Uh, not post, but in the midst of like COVID-19, uh, there's, there's even more online than, you know, in the early uh, 2000s when, when uh, Sarah was starting to think about, about Thumbelina. So it's not just Wikipedia. It's also all of these web lectures that, that we have been recording and that we have been sharing. There's so much of that information can be either found by students or more carefully, carefully curated uh, by teachers, and and these two, uh, like the the Wikipedia, uh, but also like all of the the academic presses, have of course like these beautiful kind of lecture like uh, pieces of information out there on the web, and then uh, the the curation, the possibility to curate, it's it's really out there, and um, it this allows us to take uh, the chatter. Uh, very seriously, and to see what what knowledge is actually be produced there, or what 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 knowledge can be produced, how we can create knowledge uh, out of uh, what is happening among students. For Sarah, what does he see as the major alterations for millennials in the way that they're taught and the way that they they learn? Because this is what um, for anyone who doesn't know the book, this is what the the primary task of Thumbelina is addressing. Uh, both the culture and technology of millennials, as the title states, but also the way in which they um, intake information and understand things. So what he says is that uh, with uh, networked um, technologies, media technologies, uh, students have access now to to all the knowledge in the world just uh, by by opening their mobile phone or their iPad or their laptops. So you're immediately connected to not only the university library but like every university library in the world and of course this immediately demonstrates that there is of course also a a bias or a certain partiality to Michel Serre because we know that not every student has uh, an iPad or uh, a laptop most students have uh, mobile phones but then these students may have to like walk uh, to some sort of Wi-Fi connection or whatever. But still, I mean, there, there, there is, because of media technology, uh, a certain abundance of information that students immediately have access to. And, and this changes uh, their relation to knowledge, insights, information, uh, because... Um, yeah, they don't necessarily uh, have to have to go to lectures uh, to write down the information and reread that uh, when they're at home. They they can look up whatever they want to know uh, always and everywhere. 
And um, yeah, that's that's what Michel Serre uh, talks about. And uh, recently, I was I was talking to to some students of mine about uh, who who had told me that they had never had an introduction to the library. And I was like, that is so interesting because I know for a fact that every single first year student at Utrecht University gets a tour through the library. And, uh, you know, imagine you're an art history student. They will, they will physically point you at the art history books at Utrecht University Library. The same goes for interdisciplinary studies like my students. But they, they don't recognize this as an introduction to the library. I mean, yeah, maybe the library building, but they don't recognize this as an introduction to what is also an information infra infrastructure. And, and at the same time, what we are doing as, as teachers, as educators, we are not recognizing the fact that these students, they may have wonderful like social media literacy and, and ICT habits, but we have to teach them to use them uh, in an academic way and for academic projects. Mm -hmm. So how silly to actually like tell the students, okay, here is, you know, your uh, soon to be favorite library space because here's all the art history books or here's all the philosophy books or whatever. That's not what we have to teach them. We have to teach them, okay, there's web of science, there's WorldCat, there's archive.org, there's Wikipedia, there's Twitter, there's like all of these different platforms. That's their library. And, and I think this shift uh, is what Michel Serre wants us to, to talk about uh, when he writes um, about uh, Thumbelinas. And do you think that this, this connection to this new form of a library has actually disconnected millennials in a certain way to these older forms? Um, Sayer sort of, you know, he states, how can millennials learn from a history in which they play no part? And we could sort of argue that millennials, the way in which, um, you know, current generations take in information is extremely atomized. Like you said, there's, there's, there's a disconnect between these older forms. So what happens to knowledge once it does become atomized in this way, where you don't have to do the whole, you don't have to take the whole path. You can just find the, the specific piece of the puzzle. Yes. And, and of course, I mean, this is what I discuss with uh, students. So um, students, when I, I mean, I have students that have a hard time sitting for two hours in a lecture theater. They, they start to go on Facebook. They use their phones. They're communicating amongst themselves, using their devices. They're, they're talking. Uh, and it's because they're, they're used to that. Uh, kind of uh, space, a space that is networked and a space in which information comes from left, right and center. Um, and when I bring in Michel Serre and I'm saying, look, I, I do understand why you have such difficulty like sitting here and, and listening. And, and there is actually someone like and, and, you know, I project this photo. I'm like, this is this is a professor, a French philosopher who's worked uh, for uh, the duration of his career uh, at one of the best universities in the world, Stanford. He he likes the fact that you are this way, and he he wants to be like you. He's he's when he's I I find that such a move, moving uh, fragment in Thumbelina when he talks about uh, sitting as an old man sitting in the Parisian uh, subway and seeing all of these girls and also boys like using. Uh, their mobile phones and and looking up information and images and and communicating and you hear him like being uh, jealous and and I'm like okay so so I'm I'm trying to to introduce the students to this very polemical uh, manifesto uh, about uh, changing uh, education and changing research and changing also a professional. Uh, ways of, 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 of dealing with, with information. And of course, when you push the students long enough and when you start to like this atomi atomized or atomist uh, kind of uh, dealing uh, uh, and, and access to information, when you push that long enough, they, of course, start to become nostalgic about, about frontal lectures and about like learning about the bigger picture. And, um, 
so and then my my point is always like I don't want you to necessarily change your your uh, your behavior in class. I think uh, it, that's really our responsibility as as educators. Uh, but but I do want us uh, as an intergenerational group. I want us to think about like what would be the the educational models uh, for the future, and. Um, I'm, I'm like some of the information and some of the the, the ways in which uh, Michel Serre talks about about using the internet uh, in in Thumbelina in his book. Some of this information is of course very situated and very experiential, and in that sense, very very embodied knowledge. So he has this example about oncologists who um, uh, often say, and I'm quoting him now who often say they learn more from reading blogs written by women with breast cancer than from their many years in medical school. And then there's also this example, specialists in natural history can no longer ignore what people say online, whether they are Australian farmers talking about the habits of scorpions or guides in the Pyrenees uh, discussing, um, discussing, uh, you know, these mountains and and changes uh, in and on these mountains. So, Yes, this knowledge may be, may be atomized, but it is also brought together in very interesting ways on, on the web. And um, this is all part, I think, of, of some sort of a horizontal, horizontalization, horizontalizing move, and, and also potentially, and I say potentially, uh, a decolonizing move. Um, that that can only enrich uh, what is now in in the syllabus. So we need a different perspective on what a syllabus looks like, uh, and then and then we're maybe moving with this generation. And and let's face it, we as educators, as theorists, as researchers, we're we're part of this uh, of this this algorithmic condition in this abundance of data, information, knowledge, and insights. We are using Google Scholar, uh, Web of Science uh, in, in our research, and uh, we are facing uh, the effects of um, students scanning unknown, like uh, unknown, quote unquote, sources that, that will immediately feed into our research because they simply pop up and uh, we act on them. So, um, uh, yeah, we're in this to, to speak with Rosie Bradotti again. I think when it comes to the algorithmic condition, we're in this together and we simply need to develop different ways of teaching and, and, and curating maybe access to knowledge. So it's quite a rare book in the sense that Sarah is part of this older system of doing things. You know, you say about frontal lectures or sort of striated lectures where you sit down, you listen to something, but he's part of that but actually very keen on making it clear that this new way of addressing knowledge and intaking knowledge isn't like isn't incorrect but we need to actually address this as not a mutation but an alteration from the old system it's not it should no longer be like that's not the way you do it that can't be used as a source but we should actually begin to see the benefits of this system of knowledge this is exactly what I what I try to say, and and I think that um, uh, we're now in the midst of of the COVID nineteen pandemic, and this this pandemic already demonstrates that some of some of the kind of transdisciplinary ways of dealing with knowledge that 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 Sarah, uh foresees in a way in in his book. Uh, at some point, he has an example about like studying a river. Or maybe I should say like that there's a river and uh, it has popped up in, in many different uh, disciplinary um, yeah, studies, let's say. So an anthropologist has gone there, uh, like um, uh, there's, there's people from water, climate and ecosystems that, that has gone there. There's, of course, there's uh, engineers uh, have, have looked at this river and, and you know, brought it. And, and data about it to to the university and and what do students do ideally is they they bring they kind of reconstruct this river uh, in in their research and um, and this river is just one one example I can and and that's that's more like uh, 
uh, fictional example, but like all kinds of lakes in in Africa, for example, that are now drying out because of economic, uh, social, cultural, uh, religious uh, policy, like uh, all kinds of processes. The, these these lakes are being studied by my students uh, in Utrecht, and they reconstruct. Okay, what is the best way of dealing with this environmental uh, disaster? And um, so we already see these transdisciplinary ways of dealing with, uh, with information. Uh, we see it happening. We participate in it uh, as educators and as scholars in, in more interdisciplinary programs. Uh, I, I think what you, what you said is, is just simply a summary of, of what Sarah wants us to do or advises us to do. Mm -hmm. and, and philosophically, Sarah makes this interesting point that actually for millennials, time and space um, is entirely different. So what, in what way do you think he sees time and space changing because of this new way of addressing knowledge for millennials? I think we, we can almost use uh, this, this very charged notion of, of acceleration um, in order to, to, to think about this. And um, uh, when it comes to time, obviously, and, and then there is, there is also um, a, a sense of closeness uh, when, it comes to, when it comes to space. So there is a more direct relation uh, between, or, or there can be a more direct uh, relation between, between uh, or a more instantaneous relation between uh, knowledge production uh, somewhere uh, in Latin America and uh, a student uh, here in, in, in Utrecht, for example, uh, working uh, on that um, uh, particular on 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 that particular I don't know uh, artistic uh, group or or group of designers or or maybe something that has to do with with the environment. So so there's a sense of of acceleration and closeness. Um, and and I'm yeah I'm not sure. Of course, we saw this. Uh, process of, 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 of speeding up and close, closing of gaps. We, we saw this already uh, in the postmodern condition of, of Lyotard, uh, in which he writes about, uh, the, um, uh, about ICTs entering universities. And in that sense, also like speeding up uh, processes and, and bringing scholars from different continents uh, together in, in a more immediate way. Uh, but definitely processes of, of publishing uh, were different before ICTs, let alone before uh, Web 3.0. So I think that is what you're uh, gesturing towards. Um, and uh, as I said before, I think the two generations are both uh, still in the process of, of learning how to cope with this. Um, uh, one of the the scholars that, that I would like to bring into the, the conversation is, of course, Achille Bembe, who has written about, uh, about attention and attention disorder and, and, and a changing of brains. And, and of course, this is also what Michel Serre writes about. And, and of course, with Bembe, we, we also bring in, again, the, the question of, of, of difference and a different access to information. Uh, that that is very important and that is very important to 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 keep in mind so uh, we have to look at uh, this uh, problematic at hand of the abundance of dynamic information uh, not only from a generational point of view but also from uh, from an intersectional point of view that brings in uh, questions of nation for example um, because uh, there is an acceleration and there is a closing of, of, of all kinds of, of, of information gaps uh, in, in space. But um, there is also still a difference and, and different access to uh, information. And this, this abundance of knowledge is also an abundance of, of networking and an abundance of the ability to retrieve knowledge. Um, do you not think that there's within this sort of transmission of knowledge there's sort of a, a death of a certain old way of doing things in that instead of sort of taking the whole path and learning the whole procedure, millennials sort of jump in at, at the end, grab the piece of knowledge they need, need and then retreat as opposed to learning the entire context of something. Do you not think that that's, that could be seen as a, a negative? 
uh, yeah, like a net negative with regards to the way we understand things? Well, if you present it that way, of course there is, uh, it's, it's, it's negative. <laughs> And, you know, working with, I mean, imagine you're, you're a philosophy student and you're, uh, you're using a Google Scholar uh, uh, because you're preparing yourself for the writing of a paper, term paper. And uh, for some reason, uh, one of your peers uh, at one of the big universities at Harvard has just scanned in uh, an early modern uh, philosophy uh, piece. Um, that uh, actually hasn't um, uh, been referenced much uh, because it was always accessible only at Harvard in the stacks, uh, which is uh, which is a space that you can only access uh, when you when you are a uh, an official Harvard visitor or a student or a staff member there. And now all of a sudden, this piece of information uh, in a really atomist uh, way uh, like pops up on your screen. Uh, I do. So, first of all, this happens. Second of all, uh, one could say that uh, that uh, finding um, is uh, so that piece, uh, that scan, um, is a, a serendipitous uh, finding. And the the interesting um, uh, the interesting part of research on serendipity is that. Uh, in order to successfully um, and productively respond to uh, a serendipitous uh, finding or a serendipitous connection is that you, you actually need to have the knowledge uh, in order to, that, that allows you to recognize that what you have just found is interesting. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, I don't really think that there's, there's, uh, that this student who who finds this early modern piece uh, is is going to then immediately uh, act on it unless she has had a very strong course uh, in early modern philosophy that allows her to actually think, pause, and think, what is this? Mm -hmm. So you you need and and I find this a very productive paradox. You need to know a lot in order to recognize something that serendipitously presented itself. And, and I think this may be uh, something that, um, uh, that, that could enrich uh, the, the, the thinking about, about Thumbelina. So I don't think that this student will, will, will act on it unless she, she has had a, a very strong um, uh, academic uh, course on on the subject matter, and uh, maybe there there is this very intuitive way of oh my god, what I what have I just found? Well, I hope she will just send it to either a, a senior peer or a teacher, and you know bring the piece into circulation. Um, but um, there will always be the need of. Um, uh, yeah, this 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 contextualization, and and it will always actually I should I should turn that around and say that it it will always play a role because of course the the, the student can also have read uh, a lot about early modern philosophy on on Wikipedia or on one of these you know very interesting encyclopedias uh, or or study sources uh, that that we offer students, and uh, the the course may be. Uh, may have been very much more creative or it may have not been on early modern philosophy. So she's not dependent in that sense on her teacher, um, but she is dependent on uh, knowing that uh, she is dependent on a more, a more traditional form of, of, of knowledge in order for her to, to recognize, Hey, this 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 is important. I'm either going to write my term paper on it, or I'm going to uh, just save it for future reference, or I'm going to send it to to peers and teachers. Do you think then that it's this atomization of knowledge which is for say the the thing which actually holds millennials together as a as a generation, or do you think he'd be against? Do you think even though he's talking about a generation, he is actually against generational thinking? I, I think that he performs a certain generational thinking and, and, and also a very kind of classical uh, generational thinking that, that I don't necessarily 
uh, recognize uh, in in from my own work. Um, I do think that he he would be more in favor of uh, um, yeah a more playful uh, way of of thinking about the generations. And uh, when it comes to 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 this this problem, I'm always thinking about uh, about Bergson, who has also uh, written about generations. And he says that there's a very kind of linear way of thinking about generations. You know, the 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 boy becomes the man, and then there is there is a non-linear, um, much more playful way of thinking about generations, which is there is becoming from the boy to the man. And and of course, this is a gendered uh, example, and it comes out of a gendered oeuvre. Uh, but I I do believe that when you make becoming the subject of your of your discussion. Uh, your discussion about generations is is more interesting, and and I I find that uh, the the educator, uh, and that's why I, I really read Thumbelina with educators. The the educator uh, is uh, always herself always becoming uh, with um, you know paradigm shifts in in um, uh, how do you say that in in research paradigm shifts in 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 pedagogy and in didactics and and paradigm shifts or shifts in in kind of uh the 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 knowledge economy uh, that we live in uh, so in that sense i i find educators uh, an interesting uh yes yeah, subject subject position to 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 think with um uh, because these people are forced to to move and to become with all kinds of changes that's how i would answer that question or respond to that question okay so you, so millennials for for sarah and and for yourself are rooted in a perpetual sort of becoming as opposed to having any sort of clear being to be attached to they're always they're they're inherently connected to ways of becoming well, I, I mean, Michel Serre positions Thumbelina very clearly in, in, in a certain era. So he discusses four eras in, in Thumbelina. There's writing, there's print, printing press, there's ICTs, and there's the age of algorithms. So th- there is definitely something specific about millennials. Uh, but, uh, you know, in that sense, I would have to say that, that, that we are also millennials i mean i i was i was born in in 78 so so technically when you look at the the context that wikipedia uh provides i'm not a millennial but um i'm i'm moving with all of these changes in the algorithmic condition and 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 i'm moving with students and and students teach me a lot about uh, the algorithmic uh, condition, and and I really want to strengthen their their skills. So I would say that that these these uh, processes of becoming, in a way, they're uh, they're they're not just um, attached to to millennials, uh, but we as 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 older generations were were also part of this this uh, change in in. Um, um, yeah, networked information um, flows. Um, so th- there's it's a yes and no answer. Yes, uh, there's something specific about uh, about the generation that is now studying, and no, uh, there's uh, it's it's not only them. It's also us, and it's also later generations that that will have to move within. Um, you know. Uh, automated document generation, uh, you know, net all kinds of networked uh, libraries, network databases. That's what we do. I'm I'm really intrigued to to, to hear your answer on this because it seems you're extremely passionate about teaching and actually really passionate about getting the knowledge across. So, um, and this is a big big thing for me as well with regards to grading. And Sarah is sympathetic towards reverting back to some form of qualitative form of grading as opposed to quantitative or metric or like, you know, you you scored 90%, which is somehow, I think for Sarah would always, Sarah would always hate this sort of, or dislike this sort of thing. And I think perhaps a lot of millennial melancholy towards learning is the fact that their knowledge is 
assimilated onto a, it's flattened onto a to a grading matrix, right? I think that's what they're called. Um, what do you make of Sir's comments on grading, and how 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 as an educator yourself are you? Do you think there's a way to change grading in a way that is more qualitative, or do you, do you have your own sort of preference for a grading system? Yeah. Well, um, I use both uh, rubrics, as we call them, and uh, and uh, more qualitative ways of of, of grading. Um, I and and I use rubrics at the very end of a course. So a quantitative way of grading students is something that you can use when you when you just provide feedback. When you provide feed forward, let's say, uh, in the dur- in duration of, of, of a course, uh, just sending out a rubric makes absolutely no sense. So um, then it's more narrative-based or, or conversational um, uh, grading, quote-unquote, or, or feed forward. But what I find an even more interesting model and a model that, that may be even more suitable to, to this generation is uh, something that I take from... Um, the, the, the work on the algorithmic condition that I've done with, uh, Felicity Coleman and Vera Bullman and Ashley and O'Donnell, in which we talk about, um, codes of conduct. So, uh, and, and I quite often use this way of grading in a way with students. So when students more and more, they, they, they're more and more asked to work in smaller groups. Uh, small transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary groups that that write something together, that first formulate a question together, that uh, look up sources together, that discuss these sources. And what I find interesting is to to have these students discuss their way of working, their preferred way of working, before they undertake the project. So what is their code of conduct? How are they going to communicate? Are they going to uh, use a specific platform for communication? Is it going to be WhatsApp or is it going to be Blackboard or Canvas or Microsoft Teams? Are they going to be communicating like uh, always uh, or are they going to communicate only during designated time slots? Uh, What if someone... uh, um, uh, uh, kind of um, is, is no longer able to, to participate as actively as, as before. Because, I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic. People get ill. There's all kinds of contingencies happening all, all the time. What is their contingency plan? So, so I, and, and this is what I like about, and, and then what I ask is a code of conduct is something that you, that you uh, construct, uh, that you discuss in your group and part of that can actually be the question how do you want to be graded so what are your not only group goals but also what are your individual goals with this particular course and with this particular project so do you want to learn how to become a project manager or do you want to focus exclusively on the content and do you want to be managed by, by another student who wants to learn something about, about management, group management, self-management, whatever? So th- this is an alternative to this, this dichotomy between qualitative and quantitative uh, ways of grading that I find interesting. And it's, it's something that, that students, when you call it a social contract in a way, they immediately understand what you're talking about. You don't necessarily have to say like, hey, I wrote this report and in this report we talk about codes of conduct. No, you just say that there's 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 an ethic to, to working together and just try to discuss your ethics, your 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 social contract uh, before you before you start. And and the students they like they, they understand it. They like doing it. They know they need boundaries uh, because WhatsApp is something that they also use uh, with their friends, with their family. So it's not just a professional uh, way of communication or a professional medium. Uh, so they know they need boundaries and, and they like to discuss these boundaries and, and constraints. 
Um, and they do this uh, from within a position of, of possibility. Um, and um, it's, yeah, it's something that suits this, this generation is what, I, uh, is what I feel. It's sort of the big final question, which I found it's quite a difficult one to, to answer. Um, Sarah is always sort of critical of noise and I think laws and regulations and controls and is always making apparent the, the just continual noise, which is coming at us from all angles. And he, he talks in Thumbelina about retrieving an authentic voice from what he calls the brouhaha. And this is a, this is a, a really difficult question. The, the question of the authenticity with regards to, to what one is learning is, you know, so the question is how, how can we retrieve an authentic voice from all this, this knowledge that we're now able to access, you know, within all of this atomization, how can we retrieve our, what we actually mean to say? Sorry, that's quite a big question. Well, I'm, I'm actually not sure if I can answer this, this question, um, from a Syrian kind of perspective. Um, I, I would say, uh, because, because I, I, I do find it uh, a broad and a difficult question uh, that is more like a, a question for, for, for a PhD project on uh, Michel Serre, uh, the culture and technology of millennials and, and authenticity and, and sincere finding and voicing a sincere um, statement. What I would say is um, students or millennials uh, in, the, in, in, in general, so I'm also talking about like young professionals, um, I, I think they, they will need to work their way through the abundance of information in a very situated manner. And um, this, I, I do think that this is something that we already see around us i mean there's uh there's there's environmental activism uh there is um anti-racist activism these there's these two forms of activism coming together when it comes to environmental racism for example and and very young people like deciding that they wanted that they want change uh, and and they uh, they they know that they will have to uh, also ignore certain uh, class boundaries, certain national boundaries, certain uh, identity boundaries in order to to make their point. And uh, so so the idea of um, uh, like. It's almost like I'm 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 really going back to to Donna Haraway's 1988 text Situated Knowledges in which she talks uh, very powerfully I think uh, about uh, a politics of of alliances uh, temporary alliances that you that you that you construct because you share a particular project uh, amongst peers or uh, in in very in very different kind of consortia, and to me, this is this is uh, the, the the kind of authenticity or or the sincere fo- voice that that millennials uh, can pick up, and and it is also what I see them uh, what I see them uh, kind of do, uh, not just now, uh, but also already uh, with Extinction Rebellion and all of these. Um, uh, networks and, and activist groups uh, also uh, already like uh, before the, the, the corona pandemic uh, started. Um, so, and, and before Black Lives Matter and before Me Too, I mean, I, 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 see, I see students work together in very creative ways and I see them not be scared uh, of a certain temporary nature of um, of collaborative projects and and i think this is this is what uh what what an authentic voice is and it is also a, a voice that uh is typical for this uh for this generation uh there's uh there's there's black lives matters kind of demonstrations in almost every 
uh, city or town in the Netherlands. And when you see these photos, you see very young and very different uh, people. Um, uh, yeah, taking taking a particular position in a, a global debate. And that's that's what they do. And that's what we do, because we are also demonstrating. So again, it's not just the authentic voice of, of a millennial. Uh, it's also our own voice. Okay. Um, is there anything you think we've missed or anything you'd like to add in um, here at the end? I think we had a very interesting and intense conversation. And uh, I, I'm happy that I've been able to discuss uh, teaching, teaching and learning, pedagogy, uh, didactics, which uh, in the Netherlands is is a is a very is a word for 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 the practical uh, knowledge of and the skill and the expertise of of teachers. Um, so um, thank you for your questions and um, it was fun. Thank you.